Hello everyone, this is Mary Gregory. Oh man, like I said in our previous video, it just seemed like it's been a long time uh, since we've been together. We are now going to be talking about part two of all things certification. And we are going to be talking about or com um, continuing our discussion on HCC or the CRC, HCC higher hierarchy category coding, which is part of the risk adjustment payment methodology that's out there. And uh, they, the AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders, have a CRC certification that you can sit for. I do have that certification and we do provide a CRC certification uh, class. This test is not that difficult. And as I stated in the previous video, you do have to know your coding guidelines. You do have to understand have to understand about documentation. As I stated in the previous video, uh, each certification test has some core things that you have to uh, know and understand. Uh, knowing the coding guidelines is one of them. Uh, knowing how to interpret documentation is another one. And we talked about the MEET, that's an acronym, that we use to help uh, in determining what diagnoses can be coded from the documentation. Now let's talk about a few special things that they will test you on with the CRC. Now the CRC also tests you on the different types of risk adjustment models out there. They also will test you on uh, things like uh, approved provider. Everybody that Medicare may pay is not necessarily an approved provider. And what that means for you as a test taker and as a CRC coder is that everybody's documentation cannot be used to determine a code. For instance, we know we can code outpatient. Let me make sure I say this very clearly. An outpatient, we can code from a radiology report. But guess what? A radiologist is not considered to be a treating physician for CRC, for HCC coding. And so they are not on the approved uh, provider list. Now, uh, interventional radiologist is. And you may get a question asking you which of these providers are on the approved provider list. Now remember you're not going to have your book. So some of them is really simple. A surgeon is on there. Your cardiologists are on there. Your, uh, they got it broken down by individual specialties. Internal medicine is on there. Uh, check me out. I think uh, your physical therapist may be on there. Your anesthesiologist. Well, what that means is if my anesthesiologist diagnose, give me a diagnosis, and that diagnosis meet meet. It's a diagnosis that was evaluated or treated in some type of way. Then I can code that diagnosis. But I cannot code a diagnosis off of that radiology report. Now I can code it because the rules say I can. But guess what? I cannot submit it as an approved diagnosis on that claim for that patient if on the HCC. That's all I'm saying. You have to know those. They also have an approved list of sites where we can get information from. Um, we cannot code information from a nursing home per se. Okay, hospital is an approved site, physician offices is an approved site. You cannot get information from an ambulance driver, you know. <laughs> so, and I know that you like saying, Mary, that, that only makes sense. Well, yeah, it does. But you'll be surprised at what they'll put on that uh, list and ask if you can use that information. So it's very important that you understand that. And so they're going to ask you questions about that. 
They also going to ask you a question about the predictive modeling that can be used. And so you need to study these things, okay? Um, uh, quality, they talk to you about quality, some of the different uh, quality organizations like HEDIS, H-E-D-I-S, HEDIS, Healthcare Effectiveness Data and Information. No, they widely known as the National Committee of Quality Assurance. So HEDIS, they're going to ask you about HEDIS. They expect for you to know HEDIS. They may even put that acronym on that test for you. And so you're going to have to remember some of these things. And you need to make sure you put some good notes that you need for your work in your book. And so they also talk to you about uh, some different types of things, how CMS may use data, what type of data they use. Like, for instance, uh, I think I discussed in the previous uh, video how it's not just coding that, that determine a risk factor score for a patient. It's not. It's whether that patient live in a community, meaning they live in their home. Uh, is that patient in a nursing home? Uh, is that patient disabled? The age of that patient? All of that data is also used to, uh, to uh, determine that risk factor score. And you need to remember that. A lot of times we don't want to study, but you're going to have to study. Uh, so you can remember some of these things. Uh, like they said, which type of review would CMS include uh, in a current year combined with the prior year of data? So CMS, when they come in and they set up the um, changes for the next year, they always use some prior year data in order to set the rates. And so you have to, once again, know that. Uh, CMS got a, a manual, it's called Chapter 7, in the online manual, the online internet manual. You can go and bring that manual up, it's about 73, 75 pages, and you can read and find out some of the stuff for yourself, or I think the, uh, like I said, uh, AAPC offer a course, I think, uh, in it if you want to take a complete course. If you're already doing some coding to me, all you need to do is just study for a few little special things like understanding predicted modeling. And make sure you study about the MIPS, the MIPS, M-I-P-S, M-I-P-S. It's the Merit-Based Physician Payment System that they come up with. It's been around now maybe five, six years, if not longer. I think it's a very convoluted system myself. I don't work in it. And you know, the one thing too that I think we get confused, when, I, when you are a coder, your responsibility is to code the chart. Now you're going to grow. If you want to grow, you're going to grow. And what I mean by that, you may grow where you actually having to help set up some of these programs uh, to make sure that um, the data is being captured correctly. Say for instance, when somebody comes into the office, it's important that you capture, did they come in from home or did they come in from a nursing home, see? And that data need to be submitted at least once a year. The other thing we have to realize is that each year with um, the risk adjustment, each year, everything start over. It start over, period. It just does. And so you may say, well, my patient had diabetes in 2022, Surely they're going to have it in 2023. Well, that might be true and it might not be true. Let's say you had an extremely obese person that in 2022 underwent a gastric bypass or sleeve gastrectomy. And now they have lost 150 pounds. Well, see, when you see them in 2023, they may no longer have diabetes because of the weight loss. And so even sometimes these chronic conditions can go away with certain things. Same thing with hypertension. Just because somebody have hypertension one year, generally you don't get rid of hypertension, but once again, people can change their diets, they can lose weight, and so each year, those diagnoses have to be re-evaluated and documented for you in order for you to code it. Um, 
let me talk a little, and, and predicting modeling is just a way for in a physician office, maybe in a group, if a patient, if John Doe come in, and John Doe was a patient there in 2021, haven't seen him in 2022, and now in 2023 he's back, and maybe you take a list of his medication, you put that medication into the computer, and uh, you see that the patient is on insulin. Guess what? But you don't see that the patient actually have a diagnosis or diabetes anywhere on their encounter. And that helps you to go and check and say, okay, does this patient really have diabetes? Was this the proper medication? Did we put somebody else's medicine in? And that is how you can catch some of these chronic conditions um, that, um, that the patient may have. And I was going to say something about predictive modeling. Uh, one of the things that they talk about is when they do a predictive, predictive modeling, where do they get the data from? See, it's all in this book that you can get, uh, I think, from the AAPC. You know, you can find that out there in, in that chapter 7, but you'll probably have to do a lot of reading. So you might want to uh, find your book or come to our class. We'll teach you this. Um, they use claim data. They use prescription drug uh, events. Uh, they use uh, procedure codes. They can use durable medical equipment. It's a lot of things that they can use to help them to predict how sick this patient may be for the next year. So you want to look at that. Make sure you study some of these. Get you, uh, you're going to have to, like I said, get, um, we, we've used uh, a study guide from the AAPC to put our uh, program together. And uh, so... Just make sure you are studying. I know people want an easy way out, but some things you just don't have to study. Study your guidelines. Study about documentation. Study about uh, the different quality, the different types of HCC models out there, because there's more than one. You got your Medicare model, and you got your uh, we call it uh, uh, the HHS uh, model, Health and Human Service model which follows under that Obama program. So you want to make sure you take care of that. All righty, we're going to get ready to end for the day. I've, you know, just thank you for being here today. It's sept this is actually September the 1st here in Charlotte, North Carolina. It's a beautiful day. Still pretty warm. Um, so y'all go out and have a good, uh, I think it's uh, Labor Day weekend. Have a great and safe Labor Day weekend, and I'll see you the next time. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and all those good places. And guess what? We're going to have something new coming real soon, and I hope to talk to you about it real soon.